Greetings and salutations and thank you for clicking on this video. Today I'm going to show you how to install Linux Mint 18 point whatever for somebody else. This would be a situation where you are preparing a machine and you're going to give it to a friend or a family member or maybe you are refurbishing machines. Some people do that and then they'll sell them on eBay or they'll actually have a shop where they're selling some refurbished computers and if you want to put Linux Mint on them for your customers then this is the preferred method for making it so that when they get the computer they boot it up and it prompts them to create their own user account. Some folks who do that sort of thing what they will do is they will create a generic user account and they'll make the username user and then they'll make the password password and then they'll just put a piece of paper in the box that says this is how you get into the system. If you do that, yeah, that's cool. If you know the person on the other end is going to be able to change it or if you're kind of sure the person on the other end is going to be like reinstalling the system, you could do that. But if you are selling to people that you don't know what their skill level is, when they get the computer, they might not be able to figure out how to do those kinds of personalizations and that, that can present some issues. Linux will give you the ability to change the username but it doesn't actually change the username in the home directory so that will continue to be user which might cause some confusion down the road. Also sometimes when you change the password on a Linux system not every security key on the system gets the word so what can happen is if you set the password to password and then the person boots up the computer and after they change it to whatever they want to change it to uh, what might happen is they'll click on something and then they'll get an error message which says passwords don't match up and then they'll have to figure out how to fix that so we want to avoid all that kind of stuff we want to make this really slick and also this is just going to impress the hell out of whoever you give the machine to they're going to think you are a computer genius so let's jump in. I'm going to show you how to do this. I looked online. There was not a whole lot of documentation on exactly how to do this. So I'm going to do a complete install today. Yeah, this video is probably going to run a little bit long, but I am going to try and edit out stuff like where it's installing or updating. We're not going to sit through all of that. So get a beverage, kick back, relax, and learn how to do this. So we're going to start our machine. I'm going to do this in VirtualBox today. We're going to assume that you've already checked out the machine. The machine is good to go and you are ready to install Linux Mint on that machine. And what you want to do when it boots up, just like I did here, it has a little countdown. You want to hit the space bar and what that will do is it'll take you to this menu. Choose OEM install and then click OK and we do not get the standard installer here it doesn't do what we ordinarily are used to where it boots up to a desktop and then there's an icon that says install Linux Mint it's going to dump us directly into a special installer that we're going to use to set this account up it's not hard there's no tweaking it's just a little bit of a different procedure so it should boot up and be presented to us shortly and it's going to take it a couple of seconds to load. We're not going to see a desktop, it's just going to go right into an installer. So the first thing that we need to do is pick a language. English works fine for me. And then we're going to give this little batch name here. Now what this is, it's just a way to track the OEM install and this will be put into a file on the system. It's not something that the user has access to, but this is intended for people who are creating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of machines. So what you would ordinarily do in that situation is you would create one machine and then you would have that one hard drive which you would make an image of and then for all of the other machines that you'd put together you would just clone these hard drives. You'd pop the hard drive in the machine, you wouldn't even boot it and you'd just put it in the box and ship it. So we just need to give it a batch name. You can give this anything you want. I'm going to be kind of cool with it and give it Easy Linux. And so we'll go ahead and continue. 
but that's not something the end user is going to see. That's just for tracking bugs and stuff like that. You will definitely want to install the third-party software for the person who's getting the machine so that things like MP3s and videos play right out of the box. So go forward with that. The install is very similar to what you would ordinarily do here. So if you've done this on, you know, for yourself or for, you know, help somebody else through an install, then a lot of this is going to be familiar. Of course, you know that when you click that box and you wait for it to kick in, it takes it some time. It's getting itself together in the background. At this point, it's also doing the scan of the system. Now's here where you can partition your drive, and you can partition your drives any way that you want to. If you have a single hard drive in the machine, the quickest, easiest, dirtiest way to do this is to just go ahead and tell it that you want the system to erase whatever's on it and continue. Now, if you are refurbishing machines, I would suggest that you check that hard drive out first. Make sure that you look at the smart data on it. Make sure it doesn't have any faults. And probably a really good idea would be to use a utility like Gparted to wipe that drive entirely before we get to this step. But if the drive does happen to have stuff on it, choosing a race, it'll just go away. It'll make it go away. So we'll continue. Do not set up LVMs for people who do not understand how to use them and do not encrypt anything. Uh, I, I've seen people do that. They'll choose that LVM method. They don't really know what it is. LVM is complex and it's for advanced users. In this case, the system is going to create uh, a very happy little root partition and it's going to give us a swap partition as well. We're going to go on forward with that. Now, if you want to go through and partition it to have a separate home partition or do anything sexy to it, you can go right ahead. I'm not doing that for this video. And quite honestly, for clients these days, I don't even go through that process with them because Linux Mint has made it really easy to upgrade in place. So unless they know that they're going to switch distributions, then I don't worry about it. Choose a time zone. By the way, this is temporary stuff that we're putting in right now. The only thing it's going to stick is the partitioning. So this would be for you, you know, the keyboard and all that stuff. Now, the one piece of information that is actually going to remain permanent here is the name of the machine. So what it ordinarily will do is it will choose the name of the machine that's being reported by the BIOS. And in this case, it's VirtualBox because we're working in a VirtualBox. But you could call it something like LM. 18. Let's do that. You can put anything in there you like, and that will be persistent. And you notice that we're not giving the system a name of the user. We're not creating a username. We're going to create a temporary username that will allow us to do things to the system before we pass it on. And you can put any password in here you like. It is not permanent. This is not going to be saved. The end user will never see this. And you'll see how that works in just a few moments. So we're going to go ahead and install Linux Mint. From this point forward, Linux Mint will install as it normally does. And you will be prompted to restart the machine when it's through. So we're going to pick up when we get to the message that tells us to restart the machine. All right, the install is complete. We did not get any error messages. Everything looks good, so we can proceed. So what we're going to do is restart the computer. And what this is going to do is dump us into a temporary account where we can make sure that everything's working. If you want to install software for the end user, you can do it here. You can also install the drivers, which I think is a really good idea. Make sure that they're working. And that way, when the person gets the machine, all of the hardware is functioning the way it should. And they will just be able to start using it, which is pretty awesome. So it, when it restarts, it's going to start into our special temporary account that we set up. And any changes that we make cosmetically to the system are not going to stick. So if it's a per user change, it's not going to stick. Now, 
we're getting an error message up here that Cinnamon is running in the software rendering mode. That's because we have to install drivers to make that work. So I'm going to do that in this video. We'll go ahead and take care of that. For, for right now, we can just click out of that because everything else is working. When you do this install, I forgot to mention this up front, you need to have internet hooked up to the machine and it really needs to be ethernet. Okay, don't do this with Wi-Fi if you really want to have a good solid install uh, ethernet would definitely be the way to go all of the settings for ethernet or wi-fi that you do put in when you do the install it is uh they're going to go away anyway so it's not that big a deal they're not going to get the password to your wi-fi network the installer should prompt you to set that up but if it doesn't then you need to go ahead and plug an ethernet cable in. I would just start out with ethernet just to make it as quick and easy as possible. So here we go, we have our desktop. And like I said, changes that we make here are not gonna stick, but what I am gonna do, like I do in most of my videos working with Linux Mint, is I'm gonna scale up the fonts a bit. Makes it easier for me to see and it makes it easier for you to see as well. Let's go ahead and make these pretty big and That'll just make things easier to see. Any changes that you would make in here, like resetting the background, as I said before, they're not going to stick, so don't bother with it. The end user is going to be doing that. However, we do want to update the machine, make sure that it has the all of the latest updates before we pack it up and send it off. We want to install drivers, and if you want that person on the other end to get any particular software, then you can go ahead and install it now. So if you were doing a custom install for somebody and you knew for a fact that they wanted Google Chrome, you knew for a fact that they wanted anything, then you go ahead and just do that while we're here. So the first thing is to update the system. So open up the little update manager and the update policy we're gonna choose is to update everything. Click OK. And it's gonna go out and check for updates depending on your internet connection and how fast the machine runs this could take anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour or two to do a complete update this is one of the reasons why you want to go ahead and do this so that the person on the other end they they really need to have the latest of everything and they probably don't want to sit around and do updates for two hours so we're going to install the first round and it will ask for a password and it's the one that we use to set up our temporary account. And it's taken a little while to do this here. Come on, come on, come on, let's go. Okay, we refreshed, let's install. password in and what it's going to do here is it's going to install these two packages which is mint update and then it's going to reset itself and then we'll have to do another round okay now we have our list of updates you could set these mirrors if you wanted to. I wouldn't bother with it. The person on the other end probably will have to set them themselves. Don't know whether that sticks or not when you do that anyway. Probably does, but we don't need to do that right now. We'll just use the standard mirrors. Now we're going to do our updates. This will take some time. For this thing to completely update itself. While the system is installing updates, you might get a message like this that will pop up and it's going to prompt you to make a decision whether you want to replace something or keep it as is. The default thing to do is to keep it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
All right, the updates are all done. So the next thing that we want to do is restart the computer so that we make sure everything takes effect because we did upgrade the kernel and we want to be running on the new kernel before we start installing drivers or anything else like that. You may have noticed that we have this lovely icon here on the desktop. Do not click this until you are absolutely completely done with what you're going to do to the computer. Once you click this, you will instruct the machine to delete the temporary account and the next time it will boot it will go into the installation process for the end user now we're going to take a look at how that works but for now don't mess with that because what we need to do is restart and then we'll do driver install and then we'll also do a couple of tweaks to the system just to show you some of the little tricks that I do a couple of things actually Now the beautiful part about this is that you can restart this as many times as you want and make sure that everything is working the way it should and that all the drivers are up and running and it's doing what it needs to do. Just don't click that icon that says prepare for the end user because that will delete this temporary account we're using to do this. So here it comes. We're still running in software rendering mode because we have to install the drivers which is the next thing we want to do. We go ahead and get that out of the way so what you want is to open up the driver manager and here he is right here put your password in temporary password and this is going to go out and check to see if there are any proprietary drivers for the machine if you are running graphics that require drivers they will show up here if you have a Wi-Fi card in the machine that requires firmware to run properly this is where you would install it and you would definitely want to have this installed before the end user got a hold with it in this case the only thing I'm going to install is this little AMD microcode blob just to install something so I'll show you how it works and it usually says recommended for whichever device it is they might have more than one driver to choose from but choose the one that says recommended and now it's going to install that driver shouldn't take too long to do this little one the installation of drivers is something that is very touchy you do not want anything else running on the system you want to make sure that you just let it finish what it's going to do and sometimes this can take a while to complete I mean you might think is it working is it doing what it needs to do no I mean it could take as long depending on the system and how many drivers you install as five or ten minutes now if it goes on for a half hour and it's locked up chances are it didn't work so I want to install VirtualBox drivers So I'm going to do that manually. So if you have any drivers that you need to install from installation media, if you have some sort of hardware on there and this is the only way to do that, then this is how you would do it. I'm doing it from the little CD that you insert. It's a virtual CD that the system inserts into the virtual machine. And I just want to say yes because obviously those aren't working so we'll go ahead and do that and then we'll go ahead and install these and then when it boots back up we should have full 3d acceleration and it shouldn't complain that it uh, doesn't have the correct hardware to not run in software rendering mode While this is doing this, I can show you another little tweak that I ordinarily do. Now's a good time to check the hard drive and see how that's doing. Open up disks, which is in the menu. And we only have one little virtual hard drive in here, but if you had more than one, you could click on these and then you would get an idea of the state of the drive. And of course, this is a virtual drive, so there's no smart data here. But if you did have a, a real physical hard drive, then you would actually have 
information pop up there. And when we want to go to drive settings, and the one we're concerned with is write cache, let's go ahead and turn that on. Now what this does is it lets the system buffer writes to the disk, which will make it go a lot faster for the end user. And this setting will stick. This is a root user administrative setting and it will stick. Now, if you are terribly concerned about losing data, then don't do that. But for any kind of laptop or home desktop, it's fine and it increases the performance. I do this on all my machines and I've never had any data loss from it. But it depends on what the machine is going to be doing in the end. If, of course, if this is the destination is going to be a server, you probably would not want to put that on there, that sort of thing. Of course, using Linux Mint for a server, I don't know many people that do that, but you never know, right? So when we reboot here, if all went well, not only should the machine run a little bit faster, but we should get full hardware acceleration. And yeah, we did. And that garbage that came up on the screen, that's just the driver kicking in for VirtualBox. It does that on this system. So we know that's kind of how I know that the 3D acceleration is working the way it should. So let's go ahead and eject that. Because we don't need that anymore. And we're done, pretty much. There's no other changes that we need to make, except that you might want to do something like download Chrome and install it. If you know the end user is going to want to have Google Chrome on it, uh, you could also go and install any other utilities you might want. Let's just go ahead and do one to show you how the software manager works. And that's right here, so we can just jump right in. And do test it out. Make sure all the drivers are working the way it should and that everything is as you want it to be. It takes a little while for the software manager to load. And I'm just going to install one little thing here. Let's do HTOP, which is a little utility that monitors the system and lets you control processes. So we'll do a search for that. Now, if you're installing something third party like Google Chrome, that's not in here, okay? <laughs> Don't go looking for it because it's not here. This is official software. Google Chrome is considered to be third party software. So we want to go ahead and click on that. And I'm going to tell it to install. Here we go. And it shouldn't take long. This is a really tiny program. and our system is set up. So go ahead and close that now. Like I said earlier in the video, no cosmetic changes you make here are going to stick. There is a way to get that stuff to work and that would involve editing the etc slash skell directory for the, or the skeleton directory. And that means that anytime a user account is created, those settings are automatically put in there. That is way beyond the scope of this video for more advanced users. If you want to customize this install like so that when your user uh, creates their setup they'll get a custom wallpaper or something like that, that's how you would do that. Okay, so we're done. We're going to declare this system complete and ready to ship. So now we can click this icon. Double click this here and it's going to ask for your password. This is the temporary password we set up to. Okay, now it's ready. So what we would do at this point is we would shut the machine down. We would not boot it again, put it in the box and ship it or carry it over to the person we're giving it to or put it on the shelf in the shop and go ahead and shut this down. Actually, I'm just going to restart it, and this way you can see what the end user is going to get if they're going to set up their account on this machine. So now we have gotten our new Linux Mint box from the store, or you, our friend has given it to us. This is what we're going to get the first time we boot.
took it out of the box, hooked everything up, turned it on. Oh boy. First thing it's going to do is ask us for a language. We will stick with English. That's good enough for me. Choose the time zone. If you're shipping a computer somewhere, you don't know where it's going. So that information did not stick from the earlier install. Next. Choose keyboard layout. The default is fine. And now we get something that looks like a more traditional place to create a user. So I'm going to go ahead and do this for real. And we can go ahead and change the name of the machine here. Hmm, okay. So we could leave it as is and whatever we want to call it, but what did I use in the example earlier? LM18. I was I was actually wrong, gang. That does not carry through to this part of the install. I thought it did. I thought when you name the machine, that's what you got on the other end, but the end user will be able to name it, so that's cool. That's my, I correct myself, so. All right. So I have given it that information, and they can choose to encrypt their home folder, and they can choose to automatically log in and all that stuff. I discourage that, unless there's a specific reason why you want to do that especially if it's a laptop and we're talking about logging in automatically you know, a laptop that logs in automatically can get stolen and then all they got to do is open the lid and click on it and it's like oh you're in because it's not going to be prompted for a password it's just going to roll right into this account so it's going to get itself together here what it's basically doing now is it's creating the user environment and it's doing those final settings. And once this boots up, we're going to be done with this video because we'll check and see whether HTOP got installed. That carried through. Just double check that. Sure it will. We're configuring the hardware. So this is what your end user is going to get. I mean, it's going to be really slick. I mean, they're going to think you're a genius. They're going to be like, wow, you know, this guy really knows what he's doing. Look at this, this machine. It's so slick and professional. You might even want to like type up a guide of what this thing is doing and put it in the box too. You know, here's what to do with your new computer. And then you could go through and give them pointers on setting up their personal account. And it's so much easier than having them do a complete install. And it's so much nicer too, because like I said, if you create a generic account and hand it to them, they're, they're not gonna know how to change all that. Really the best way to change that if you do get a computer like that is just simply create a new user account for yourself and make sure that new user account has administrative privileges and then log into that account and then delete the generic account that came with the machine. Okay, so we have the login screen here. Click on the name. Put our password in. Okay, and it should be our first boot up into Linux Mint. Okay, drivers appear to be working properly. Desktop looks all right. Let's see if HTOP is included. HTOP is in the menu too, gang. But I'm just gonna launch it from a terminal. So let's just do HTOP. Yeah, buddy. We're good to go. Working the way it ought to. So thank you, gang, for watching the video. I certainly do appreciate it. it it's a lot of fun to do these kind of videos. And I want to give a shout-out to EasySit. 
he inspired me to do this video because we got a thing working on going on we working together easy sit is a youtuber that has a really cool channel so I'm gonna put the link to his channel in here and what he does is he's a tinker he likes to play with computers and he likes to do a lot of videos where he installs old operating systems and he'll show you how you could install things like you know Red Hat 9 and <laughs> stuff like that it's fun it's a fun channel if you're a, a computer geek so check it out and I'll put the link in the description to this video we got a thing going on and I'll have more details about this uh, he just inspired me to do this video because uh, he's the kind of person I'm talking about. He's rebuilding machines. He's doing this. And I'll say, hey, man, let me show you how to do this. This is really nifty. So check out Easy Linux on the web. Check out Easy Linux on Facebook. There's always a lot of cool things going on over there. And check out FreedomPenguin.com for lots of great stories about Linux from contributors such as myself. I've got a new one up there that just was put up this week, so you can take a look at that. And we're going to do this again soon. Thank you so much for watching.